Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, uh, sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Peter Murray, and I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's event. Uh, today's topic is designing your own Folio app, no need to be a programmer. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. Uh, as an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. Uh, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, that said, uh, we do value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Uh, use the question box within WebEx to uh, enter questions and comments as they come to you. Uh, our speaker will address the questions uh, at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, but please know that uh, we may not <coughs> excuse me, see your comments uh, on Twitter during the forum. Uh, we also continue to uh, continue the conversation on this topic uh, on the Folio Discussion website, uh, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Philip Jacobson. Uh, Philip is a user experience and interaction designer and founder of Somag, Somag, Someg. Uh, no, I messed that up, Philip. I'm going to have Someg. to ask you. Someg, thank you. Uh, Sumig is a UX and interaction design company working with global projects uh, from Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, before founding Sumig, uh, Philip has worked both as an independent design consultant uh, and as the in-house creative director in a software project. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Philip. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, so um, I think I'll just start out by sharing my screen. I, have to, I guess I have to be given the oh. presenter's rights or something. Yes, let me give you the presenter ball. Thanks. All right. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yes, we can. Good. Yeah, so like Peter said, I work with user experience and interaction design, and that means that I, I help software companies um, create stuff that's easy to use for regular people. Uh, because um, even though something is technically advanced, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's very easy to use. So that's where me and my team come in, and we try to help out with designing some interfaces uh, and some flows and some interactions that are intuitive in a way so that you don't have to intellectually uh, think about what you have to do, but it just feels right and it makes sense that when you try something out, it works. Um, and so that's very much the, the approach we're taking for this uh, Folio project, that we're trying to build a, um, a, a layout, a prototype of the system um, that, uh, that you can click around in and try out, and then we use that to get feedback from experts from, from different areas of libraries, uh, and then adapt the interface until it makes um, as much sense as it can, uh, being a uh, kind of a static, uh, semi-static uh, prototype. Um, so, yeah, so the approach we've been taking for this whole Folio platform, I, I assume the people participating in this uh, meeting today have some familiarity with the project, but Folio is a modular, extensible library platform. So that means that uh, we are designing the platform that everything runs on, and then we're designing some basic apps uh, currently um, so that the system will be good for implementing and getting started in, in any institution. Uh, but then we expect a community of uh, third-party developers uh, to develop different apps for the platform. So just like on your iPhone or your Android, the phone comes with a messaging app and a phone app and a, an email app, but you, you might install a bunch of other apps that do other things. And so that's kind of the philosophy of this platform, that we want to make it easy to extend the platform, 
to do exactly what you need and then to share anything you build in your institution with other institutions. Um, yeah, um, so the, and so the way we approach the project in terms of how we design things is we've been designing this interactive prototype which is available on this URL that I'll just see if I can throw in the chat. Um, there we go. Uh, so that's a prototype of the system, the way it would look if you've used it before and then log in again. So it's always already filled out with data. Uh, so you can see that um, I've been logged in before and I searched for Boston and then I'm viewing the results of that and I've chosen to look at a patron called John Doe in this case. Uh, so it seems a little daunting when you get into it just like that, but just understand that it's shown as an example of what it would look like if someone has already been using the system. Uh, but, but yeah, we're ba basically we're starting from a user perspective rather than starting from a technical view and trying to build something that works technically. We're trying to figure out what is it actually that libraries need um, and, and institutions need that will be running this platform. And so that's worked pretty well. I think we're, we're, we have a really good direction for the project and the, we're getting good feedback on that. And so at one point someone reached out to me from a library asking if uh, it would be possible to get access to this these assets I'm, I'm, we've been using to build this interactive uh, prototype so that you can create these different, you know, popovers and um, little windows and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, so what I did, rather than just trying to give someone a bunch of assets that would be difficult to figure out how to use, is I built a starter project, like a template for someone to build their own app. And so the, the interface is, is structured in a way that you have this universal header bar, and then you have these different apps that you can open. And depending on the institution, you might have chosen to install different apps uh, that make sense for your use. Uh, and so that's why people will want to develop uh, third-party applications. And so one of these apps might be your app um, in the future. Uh, but a step before actually coding the app, or a good, a good thing to do before, is to design it and show it to users, get feedback, and adjust it. And that can be really expensive and um, cumbersome to do if you do it with code, but it's quite flexible and fast and cheap to do it if you do it in a program like uh, Proto.io, which is what we're using for this. There are other programs out there, and some people just use some people just use a piece of paper, which is also just fine. And some people use Photoshop or uh, Balsamic or UX Pin. We've chosen to use Proto.io because it, it fits the complexity of this project uh, best. Um, and so, yeah, so someone reached out to me to hear if they could start doing a prototype like this for their own app. Um, and so I posted this uh, this blog post on, on the Folio um, discussion website called discuss.folio.org. Um, and that link I just put in the chat. Um, so if everyone, uh, I assume most people here are here because they want to know how to build their own app without programming. So I'm going to run this very much hands-on and just explain to you guys how to do it. And I'm hoping you can follow along on your own computers, uh, open up the links, create the project as I show you how to do it, etc. Uh, that way, uh, the pro then you can ask the questions later on in this session. Uh, and it's also easier for you to remember if you've been doing something rather than just listening to some guy from Copenhagen speak for an hour and a half. Um, so if you go to this blog post, you'll see that uh, I explain a little bit about uh, why, why I've been doing this, but uh, there, is an, there are some instructions to how you can get started. And so I think I'm just going to go through and show you guys how to get started with this uh, and that's probably the best way to, to introduce you to it. So the first thing you need to do is to sign up for Proto.io. And you can go to proto.io uh, and sign up there and that will give you two weeks of free trial. Um, but I actually contacted the Proto.io guys and they were so nice to, to give us an extended trial. And if you click on the link in this blog post, which is uh, proto.io slash promo slash folio, I'll just put it in the chat as well. And you get get to this um, 
this landing page here where you can see it says Proto.io Postfolio. And if you sign up here, you get 60 days of free trial, so two months, which should be more than enough for anyone building, you know, their first step. Um, and so if you build something here, you can then, you can edit it as you go along as long as the trial lasts or if you sign up later on. Uh, but if you want to share it, you can share it in a way that it's still accessible after the 60 days. So as long as you can build it in 60 days, uh, then you can publish it and it can still be available after that period. Uh, if you publish it to something called Proto.io Spaces. Um, yeah, but uh, maybe let's Philip, start out by... If I can interject yeah. for just a moment. Uh, when you send uh, links to uh, people in uh, the uh, chat window, uh, be sure yeah. under the send to uh, pull down, you select uh, all participants. Uh, I've been ah, following just, along. Okay. Yeah, I've been following along with you and, and putting links in, but uh, as you add okay. more of them, uh, be sure to do that. What I, I selected all attendees. What's the difference between a participant and an attendee? Oh, uh, okay. Maybe uh, all attendees uh, is uh, everyone except the uh, hosts and the uh, uh, panelists. So uh, every, I, I think everyone's been seeing them but me. <laughs> okay. I'll. I'll I'll, I posted it there again to all participants. Everyone Perfect. can actually see it now. Okay, I see it now too. I, I wasn't seeing it before either. Okay, great. Thank you, Philip. Sure. Um, so we have this uh, sign up page. So I'm just going to go ahead and sign up here. So I'll use my, uh, oh, this is for my name. I'll put in my name and then I'll put in my email address uh, and then click sign up free. And then it should. Uh, yeah, then it sends me an email that I have to confirm uh, so they make sure that I put in the right email address. So I'm just going to go to my inbox, and here I have a no reply at Proto.io email with a link that I can click to verify my email. And then I, they ask me to choose a password, so I'm just going to choose something um, and click continue. Yeah, that works. It's a bit slow here. Uh, all right. And then I get in, uh, and they want to have something for their statistics, which I'm not interested in getting them in this situation. But I'll just close this. Uh, and then it gives you a chance to say, or, uh, you know, try a sample project, which will open up a project that has some different tips and stuff. Uh, I'm just going to open that up and you guys can do the same. And then we can just take a look at the interface of the application. So I click uh, try a sample project. And then what it's done is it's created a project here called Smoothies to Door, which is basically a, an imagined app for some kind of smoothie delivery service, apparently quite peculiar, but um, I'm going to click edit on that. Um, or maybe, yeah, I'm going to click edit on that. Let's do that. Um, good. So I'll just give you guys a few seconds to, to get to this point. All right. Um, so. The way this interface is structured is we have um, a bunch of things you can do, and you, it seems a little daunting just uh, seeing it for the first time probably. Uh, but basically, you have a list of different screens in your app over here. Uh, and then for the screen you're on right now, which is this start screen, you have a list of layers. And then uh, what you do in this program is you basically you design things in here or you design something in a graphics program and put it in here. And then you can link up different elements. So you could take this button and say this should open up you know, a different screen or something. Uh, and then the, the people at Proto.io put in all these tips to explain something about this simple project. Um, but the first thing I think we should do is just, uh, if you move your mouse to the top right corner of the interface, there is a button that says preview. Uh, and if you click on that, then it opens up a new browser tab uh, and loads this, uh, you know, uh, phone with uh, an app inside. 
And this is the project that we have open here, but just shown as you would see it when you actually experience the app rather than build it. And so this allows us to click around on the different screens out here, but that's actually not that interesting. The interesting thing is that in here you can actually uh, interact with the prototypes. You can click on the button here to start the tour, and you can swipe through. If you click and drag on these, it acts as if it was a touch screen, and you could, you know, uh, swipe through. And actually, your uh, the one cool thing about Proto.io is if you're doing touch interfaces, then it allows you to do this on a mobile phone. We have an app you can download, and then um, you can open this prototype, and you can actually swipe through this with your fingers. So it feels very much like a finished app. Uh, but if you click continue, you get into this interface where you can put in a username and a password. And it, it, there's no real data in this prototype. It's just pretending that there's, you know, a real service behind this. Uh, but the important thing is when you build these kinds of prototypes to give the user a feeling that this is a real app because then they can give you as close to real feedback as you can get without actually spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of coding the whole thing and then figuring out that the structure is all wrong. Uh, so you can click uh, sign in and then um, you can scroll through these different uh, elements. And this looks super complex, but the way they they allow you to build this stuff in um, proto actually makes it quite simple. So this, for example, is just a layout that you check a uh, little checkbox that says that you can scroll it and that it should snap. So it's this kind of snap container. Um, and then clicking on these different things, I, I imagine opens up, yeah, it opens up a different screen with some animation, which is also, once you get into it, it's quite, it's quite easy. Um, so you can click around in this interface and do some different things. Um, if you click somewhere where nothing happens, it's going to highlight for you these little blue spots uh, that show uh, where you can click. So in this case, I can click plus minus back and so on. Um, you're also able to change the look and feel of this uh, prototype if you if you want to do that. Um, yeah, but that's basically where your prototype ends up. It's in this viewer, so you can either open this up in a browser. So that's in a browser on your computer, your laptop, or your even on your tablet. Um, you can also open it up in, in this app specifically for Android or iOS, uh, which is probably not that relevant for these folio apps you're going to be, able, be building, but um, it's nice to know that if you, well, you might want to build some mobile app that integrates with folio IO, um, and folio will in the, in the long run be mobile friendly also is the plan, uh, but that maybe not where you want to start up. All right. So let's go back to the editor and I'll just walk you guys through the basics of the interface uh, and then we'll try to, um, to, to do something ourselves uh, after that. But here we are on the home page uh, and if you click around in these different screens out here, you'll see that it shows you some of those screens that we were just exploring in the preview. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it for these screens. Uh, you can do some more advanced stuff, but that's usually it's not that relevant. But let's try and open this screen called Smoothies List, because uh, that's the one I believe we were looking at where you can scroll through it. Um, yeah, so if you try and, uh, and open that one, then if you look, look down here in the Layers menu, you can see that, that there are a bunch of different elements, like the status bar and the headline that's called Smoothies. Etc. But the interesting part is um, this uh, smoothie list vertical. You can, by the way, resize all these panels to fit um, your screen or whatever you need. So smoothie list vertical scrollable container, long name. You can call these whatever you want. But you can either double click on the layer here or you can double click on the element over here. I'm just going to double click in the layer here on the icon out here. If you click on the text, it might want to rename it, but if you click on the icon, it opens up this, uh, what they call a container. Uh, and so a container is a lot like a, uh, a, like an independent element in the system, but where a screen is an actual screen that you would open, a container can be embedded in different screens. So you could 
make one container, put it on a hundred different screens, and then if you edit the container, then the hundred screens update that container on them. So it could be something like a header bar or a any kind of navigation that usually persists between screens. You'd make that as a container, and then it's easy to maintain if you want to add an extra menu item or something like that. And so what you see here is uh, surprisingly simple, actually, compared to what you might expect. It's basically just a very tall view uh, with graphics on it. So you can move these around. Um, there's nothing magical or very advanced about them. It's just uh, graphics with, I think they have a link on some of them to open some other screens. But the interesting thing is that if you navigate over here on the left to you have screens and you have containers. If you click on the screens part and then again on the smoothies list, you can also click here in the breadcrumb you have here to go back to, this, to the smoothies list screen. Um, if you click on smoothies list, you'll see that if you change something, it's updated here, but uh, it's basically just a container that's the height of the screen. But what it has is it has some properties. When you click on it, it opens up this properties win window. Um, and then you can tell it for the scroll properties, what should it do? And so let's, in this case, they said, I want to scroll it vertically. Um, you could set it to horizontally or omnidirectional. And then you could tell it that uh, you want it to be a carousel or snap container. And you can do a bunch of different, quite advanced stuff here just with a few clicks. Um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. It's just to show you that you can do something that's that's pretty impressive when people look at it, but you don't have to be a brilliant programmer to do it uh, when you use a tool like this one. All right, so let's have a look at the project that I made for you to be able to um, create your own folio app. So I'm just going to close this uh, sample project down and this preview. And go back to proto.io. And then it sends me to the front page, and I click sign in. And since I'm already signed in, it just takes me to this uh, project interface. Uh, all right. You can keep this sample project here to work with it later, or you can delete it. If you delete it, you can always get it back by clicking down here, try a sample project. Then it will bring that back that smoothies project to you. Um, all right, so getting back to that blog post I showed you guys before, um, this one here. I'll just send it again so everyone can see it. There we go. Um, it, it tells you how to get started. So we created an account. Uh, and then you have to copy this starter project that I made. It's like a, a little template that you can use. You could just build stuff up from scratch and try to make it fit the look and feel and structure of this folio prototype. But it's basically just to make it easy for you to, to do something that looks like a folio app and feels like a folio app. So it's easier to get started. Um, and the way you do that is you click on the link here, Folio Starter Project, um, which opens up um, the Folio Starter Project on this Proto.io spaces. So think of Proto.io Spaces as, you know, like Dropbox or a Google Drive for these, inter for these interface projects. So it's a, it's a way that you can share it so everyone can access it. Um, you don't have to, to put it out here, but it's a good way to, to make it accessible to people. And so what you can do here is you go, you click on this button down here that says, uh, if you hover over it, it says import in the tooltip. It has a little cloud with a, a down arrow on it. If you click on that, um, then, oh, if you click on, okay, uh, it says I need to finish my profile. And that means I just need to add a profile name. So I'm just going to call it something random. Um, and this will determine if you put something out on spaces where it's going to be. Uh, but that's all you have to fill out here. So you click complete profile and activate my spaces account. And that's basically it. And then we can click back in the browser 
And let's see if it works this time. So we click import. Um, okay. Very interesting. Um, why am I not allowed to do it? Okay. I'm going to share you the, the link with you guys that Proto.io has put out themselves on how to um, import the thing, just so you have that. Um, but the last time I did this, um, it was working. So let's figure out what's wrong. They keep changing these things. And since it's a software in the browser, it's just updated. Uh, Import. Okay, I'm just going to try to fill out all of these, see if that makes any difference. Com. Okay. All right. Well, Okay, this is a, a mystery to me. I don't know why it doesn't work. Um, well, if if I can't get it to work, I can at least show you guys the project and, and how to do it. Or maybe we can, um, I think I'll just show you guys some more uh, tips on how to use the interface. And then, um, and then um, I can show you guys the project and how to use it, and then see if I can <laughs> figure out uh, how you guys can actually get access to it. Um, I'm just going to spend two minutes on this, see if I can get it to work, because it's much more fun for you guys if it actually. Yep, I would say um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Sorry? Yep, I would say go ahead. Let's. Uh, this is the, the risk of a live demo, but uh, see if we can get it to work. Yep. Um. In, in the meantime, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions throughout the, the presentation, feel free to put them into the Q&A. And um, if we can answer them on the spot, we will. Otherwise, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so feel free to enter them in at any time. OK, I found the, challenge, the problem. So it looks like Proto.io Spaces and Proto.io, the editing platform, is two different platforms. That's, that's problematic in this case. But now we know. Um, so I wasn't signed in to the Spaces. So I'm going to just show you guys what I did. So you click up here. If you're on spaces.proto.io, put that in the chat. And then up in the top right corner, there's a link that says sign in. If you click on that, then you can put in that uh, login that you, um, maybe it will just sign you in because it can see that you're logged into Proto.io. Uh, but maybe you have to put in your credentials again. And then you can get in. All right. And now that you're in, you can open that um, that link that we had before. It's in the chat, and it's this one. This link here. Um, good. That's good. All right. Um, then you can uh, click on this copy folio starter project link here in this one. And that will take you to this page again. And now you should be able to click this little cloud with an arrow down button. Um, and then it says, uh, do you want to import from Proto.io spaces? You want to import the folio app starter project. And then you just click import and wait a little because it's copying all the data. And then you should have uh, the prototype 
uh, Folio app style project over here. So I'll just give you guys 10 seconds to do that. So um, now you, can, you could click preview on this, which would give you the preview, but it's a pretty boring project if nothing has been put in it. So I'm just going to click edit so I can show you guys what's in this project. And so we get the same interface again with the screens, the containers, the layers, and all these other things you can do. Uh, and I tried to structure it uh, in the most pedagogical way that I could so that it's kind of easy to get started. So I made these screens that aren't meant to be used. They're just here to explain what this uh, project can be used for. So you have getting started, app template, elements, and change app icon. So if we click on getting started, I'm, I, I try to explain um, what this project is for um, and, uh, and what you can use it for. Um, and I talk a little bit about the general UX values we, we tried to follow in this project. Um, and um, there's a link that only works, I believe, if you preview it. But you, uh, yeah, let's, I'll just click preview here up in the right corner and you get the preview. Uh, and then, well, if you click on this, you can't get very much. But out here in the side, you can actually click on these getting started at some place. And then you can click on this uh, UX values link. And that's basically a, it's just a Google Doc. Uh, so the, it doesn't, it's not very fancy, but the content of it is hopefully, um, is hopefully helpful. It's a living document, so you might see a few comments here and there. But it's basically going through how do we want to approach um, the Folio platform, but also how do we hope that third-party developers and designers will approach designing stuff for the Folio platform. So it talks about uh, some of the things that we've found in our research is important for institutions working with this kind of software, um, and some things that are, in general, just what people expect from uh, web apps uh, software that runs in a browser. And then uh, some things that are relating to the, the target market of this software. And, uh, so depending on what your app does, specifically it's something that's, that relates to you know, a certain workflow for a certain local consortium in a certain location, then the global thing maybe isn't so important. But we try to encourage people, for example, to, to make all their uh, interfaces um, Maybe not to localize them to different languages uh, and translate them, but at least make it easy for other people to do so. So even if you develop an app that's just to begin with meant to be used in one language or one location, someone you know on the other side of the globe running Folio might want to take that and, and translate it and use it or take that and then adapt it. Of course, depending on what life and you have yeah, uh, But you can look through this document. It's, uh, I tried to keep it very short. Um, and easy to, to get through. And then it talks a little bit about the styling of the interface, uh, and that's, of course, important to make the users feel at home in your app so that it's consistent with the way that it feels in other apps in the system. Um, but there isn't, like, with the amounts of data that libraries usually have to work with, there isn't much room for uh, any kind of ornaments or something like that. So it's, it's mostly just talking about how how to not ornament your stuff too much uh, and, and still keep it, you know, make something that's easy to get an overview of and easy to, to navigate and so on. Uh, then either if you're in here in the edit view, you can click on out here on app templates, or if you're in the preview, if you prefer to look out here, you can click on app templates up here. Um, and that's, yeah. So if we go to the next one called App Templates, then uh, it, it just gives you a quick overview of a different, few different paradigms or ways to navigate your app. And so uh, this comes from um, this, uh, let me open up, yeah, this platform demo uh, 
uh, platform prototype, the way that we we tried to, to build some basic apps to show uh, and to get feedback on those. So something like a users app where you can manage users, a catalog app. It doesn't do much right now, but you can just you know, there is a catalog app. Uh, you can scan stuff in different ways, checking in, checking out, etc. So what we found out building all these apps is that uh, there are some structures for this format and for this purpose that make a lot of sense so that you you might benefit from using one of those standard structures. Um, so one way, one standard structure might be a search and filter template. So that means you have the universal header, you have that on everything, you can't get rid of that. And that's a way for the users always to be able to get back to, to switch to another app and make sure that nothing, even if your app crashes, they can still use the system without any problems. Uh, but apart from that, you have a search and filter bar, which is like the one we saw in the in the users app, for example. Where over here you can search for, uh, you know, you could search for the ID of a patron uh, or a user, and then you can filter and say, I want to use staff, or I just want to view uh, patrons who aren't staff, etc. And so you have a search bar, search and filter bar. And you have a results bar, which is the you know it's it's filtered by whatever input you put in over here, and then you can choose something in this pane that will then show your preview here on the right. And the preview might have a sub menu to make it easy to you know, scroll up and down and navigate this one here. Uh, but basically, this whole thing is just a, a user profile. Um, so that's one kind of basic uh, structure that, that will be relevant in a lot of contexts. Another kind of structure is na a navigational structure. And you know this from, um, you know this from a lot of, uh, well, you know, you know it from basically every system you might have ever used. So the file explorer on Windows or the finder on the Mac has this structure where you can uh, click on different things and you get, you know, a hierarchical view of whatever it is you've been looking at. Um, and you know it from your iPhone, from your Android, you know, almost any any system has something like this. Uh, and in the folio prototype, an example would be the settings uh, screen where you have uh, these different, an S section with the settings for each app. And if you click on users, for example, then you have different settings you can set there. And if you click on that, you get uh, you might get e another sub menu, and so basically you're just drilling down into the structure of things. It doesn't mean that the data has to be that way. It's just how you know how would you find stuff? And sometimes a hierarchical structure is is better than having to search for something if you're you know if you're not exactly sure what you should you should you should search for. Um, so that's another one. And then in this in this project, I've also included a blank template because you might want to do a different kind of interface that we haven't thought of, or that's very specific, or that's a mix of these things. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. And, and so uh, a note on this is that uh, you, you, a note on this is that uh, the way we're building the code is we're building in, in these components. So that means that a search bar is something that you would come you know, out of the box if you're a programmer, you could basically just almost copy paste a block of you know of code that means here's a search field and here's a filter pane. And we might also bundle these components up into full packages. So something like a search and filter app would be, you know, you can get in a, a template of real code and then adjust it to put in your sources of data or whatever you would need. Um, and so that's the that's the case for everything in the system. So let's take the the users app, the, the icon, the yellow icon here with the little man on the users app. Here we have a list of results, and so that seems fairly simple, uh, and it is simple for the end user. Um, but there's a lot of functionality that might be in a list like this. So if you click on the three dots, more options uh, up here. This one. Um, then you'd be able to filter. You can't do it in this prototype. It's just to show show the concept of it. You'd be able to filter the metadata in this list, and you'd be able to select all things in the list, deselect, batch, edit things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all these 
different things that we built for uh, for this users app list. We're not going to just build it for that, and then if you want to do that in your app, you have to build it from scratch. We can build it as a component that you can reuse, so that if you want a list including all this stuff with selecting and batch editing, etc., uh, or anything else we put on in the future, you basically just copy. You know, you take that component that's already built and they tell it what data you want in there. Uh, so that it's much faster to develop something if you need to use these standard components like a search field, filtering, a list, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, so when you design your app, it might be, uh, you know, economical in a way, if you think about how, how you're going to develop it, to use these standard components. And uh, so we're still just uh, developing all these things. So there isn't any documentation uh, yet that's easy for people like me, designers, to go and see which components do we have. We're, we're, go we're going to have that. We just don't have it yet. Uh, but I do believe that there's some technical, there's some code repositories that you can look at where I don't know if we have any components there yet or if they're still in the works. But uh, yeah, that's, that's an important note to understand that we're not trying to make something where you have to build everything from scratch. You can if you want to, uh, but we want to make it easy to to get stuff done in the system. Also for, for developers, not just for the end users. All right. Uh, so if you click on the next screen over here, or if you're in the preview, it's on the other side, called Elements, uh, you'll see a, um, a little list of uh, elements. So there's a some buttons, there's a filter section, um, there's a list of things, and then I just made a little section called more elements that um, that's, that extends to you that over here you can find more elements. So if you need a circle or an image or more complex stuff like a video player, all these things are already here in the libraries. And you can choose different libraries. Uh, so there's a library for iOS. Or Windows, etc., and um, and so some of these libraries have elements that are quite useful for even doing something that's not meant specifically for that platform, uh, but where it, it the, the behavior of that element might be the same. So let's take iOS for example. They have this um, actually this list I believe is um, is from iOS. You know, it's um, it's just because the technical functionality of selecting and deselecting stuff is they put it into the iOS element uh, or a checkbox like this, which will work um, out of the box um, if you put it into the interface. So I'll just try and do that. I'll put in some random checkboxes here. Uh, then I'll click Save so that uh, so that I can preview it because it only previews what you've actually saved. And then I click Preview again, and it reloads this prototype, and then. If I open up that element screen, you can see there are some checkboxes here, and I can check them off. It, it doesn't do anything, but you can then use that checkbox to cop, uh, couple it to something else to make something, um, to make the prototype do something more sophisticated. And you can also see that if you click in these sample elements here, the list uh, uh, or this uh, results list, that it, it actually shows you that it's selecting and deselecting something. It's not really doing anything functional, but you can give people a, you can make it do something in the prototype, uh, not with real data, but you can make it look like something is happening in the system based on how people interact with these things. All right, and I, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, so it's not like there's a whole lot of things going on uh, in terms of what elements you can use. Um, if a lot of people use this, I'll, I'll expand this start a project with more things. Um, and if you guys, even if you want to do this in another program in Proto.io, I'd be happy to provide you with, with the assets that you need to work with it in Sketch or Photoshop or Microsoft PowerPoint or Google Slides. What do I know? Uh, the important thing is just we want to encourage people to do this design process before putting software out there because it's really important to get the user's feedback um, and what, what we're doing. All right. Uh, the next and the last uh, of these introduction slides is called Change App Icon. And so I've been told by the first person who used this to build their own app, which I can show you soon, um, 
that it didn't work when he tried it. So I think I'll just try it here now and you guys can try it as well if you want. Uh, and let's see if it works. So I'm, I'm writing here that um, you can upload a something called icon.png. So it's basically an image file um, that has a ratio of one to one. So it should be square um, and, and at least 200 pixels. And then it should uh, up, up, update this project so that when you're in on this screen here, it will put in your icon here. And when you're on this screen here, it'll put in your icon here. Um, so I'm just going to try and open up a graphics program. This could be Microsoft Paint or Photoshop or uh, a lot of other programs. And then I'm going to create a new file, um, 200. I think I'll make it a little bigger, 600 by 600 pixels. And then I will put in something. Um, I think I'll just draw a little smiley face. Beautiful. That's the height of my artistic skills. Um, so I'm going to save this on my computer. Uh, it used to be called, and this is an important part, it, I'm going to save for web. It needs to be called icon.png, otherwise it won't work. So I'm going to save that here. Save. And then I should be able to just drag that in like I show here from your computer. So your Windows, uh, sorry, Mac Finder or from Windows File Explorer or from your desktop, you can grab that file, icon.png, and pull it in here. And then let's see if it actually works or not. Um, okay, let's see. Maybe not. Okay, anyway, it does work. Okay, so. I'll save that and click preview. Um, you shouldn't do anything other than just drag it into that uh, section over here called assets, uh, and then it should replace the existing icon file. So that means that when you run your project out here, it shows your icon, uh, and uh, you can of course adjust all this text and write who made it, made the prototype, and then when you open up the prototype, it shows your icon up here. And so that's a great way just to brand it in a way, make it feel more like a real app so that the people who use it um, uh, get a good experience. And also basically to test out what, if you make an app icon, how, how detailed can you actually make it? Which, and the answer to that is not very detailed at all because you have something like 36 pixels by 36 pixels to do that. Um, so color is a great way to, to spice up that design but usually one one color or maximum two, or, and then some very robust, simple shapes is, um, is good for that. All right, so that's all the introduction slides. Um, so if we take a look over here, I tried to put in, I put in these blank screens that are just, uh, the name of them are just a lot of dashes, but that's just to separate these screens so you have the explanatory screens, the introduction screens, and then uh, some advanced stuff and something that you shouldn't touch, basically. Um, the one you, sh yeah, let's take these first. Uh, Peter, I just have to ask, is this meeting scheduled for one hour or one and a half hour? Uh, one and a half hours. All right, cool. So last time I did a presentation, I, I hurried up to get it done in, in an hour and then, oh yeah, it was 90 minutes. Uh, I'll make sure to leave some room for questions in the end. Let's, let's see if we can get through this stuff. Um, so if you click on this your app colon intro screen, then you get this this view that we saw before, uh, where you have now you have the icon that you uploaded if you uploaded one, and then we have the app name. So that might be, let's say I want to make an app for these uh, info screens. Um, that you have, you, know, you can have in some libraries to, you know, show people tips for reading or uh, short messages. So let's say I develop an app for taking PowerPoint presentations, uploading them to Folio, and then that 
in that way I can manage what's on the, all the screens in the library, for example. It's just a funny little example, but uh, I'm sure you guys would be, might be building something much more complex than that. But um, yeah, and then you can, as I write, you can use this area to explain stuff. And you should aim for designing something that, that's kind of self-explanatory in how you use it. And that's, that has a lot to do with um, using conventions that people know from uh, using a browser, using their PC or Mac, uh, using their phones and their tablets. Um, so the way that, that menus work, for example, in your browser with these drop downs and fly out menus, uh, the way that um, navigation works, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it has a lot to do with what people know and it also has to do what people know that isn't exactly uh, software design. So for example, if you're in a, a European uh, country or in, um, in America, you, you're probably reading from left to right if you're reading English, for example. And so that's also how we decode an interface like this. So we start up out he up here. That's like the start for us. Uh, if you're doing an Arabic interface, it's, it's up here instead because you read top down, right to left. But for us, it's up here and then we, and that kind of defines, okay, where are we? What are we reading? If this was a book, then the chapter name would probably be somewhere up here. Uh, and then we we look into, okay, I'm in this app, I'm on this sub page, um, and then I have this interface. And then I have a, a left, the left pane here kind of defines the first level of information. So that's, you know, if, if it's a search and filter pane, that defines what's in the next pane because we decode stuff the way we read from left to right uh, if we're reading English usually. That's what we're used to. If you're if you're reading Arabic usually, Arabic, then um, you'd read the other way. And so we're trying to build polio in a way that it can support those use cases. Uh, so if you're writing Hebrew or Arabic, then uh, you basically just indicate that in the code and then the whole interface just turns around. And that's another uh, argument for why it's a good thing to use these standard components because when we build the components, uh, we build all that uh, bi-directional functionality into it. And if you build your own, you would have to do that uh, by yourself, which can be uh, a little more time consuming. Um, yeah, so, so basically, um, so basically, you have to think about how people experience software and that's based on how they know other software to be and how they, yeah, stuff like the reading direction, uh, the, there's a lot of symbolism in color, in icons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that can help you make the experience a good one for the user. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the intro screen. It doesn't do much. Uh, if we look at this button here, uh, I'm going to introduce you to how to do some basic interactions in the system. So this button isn't, it could be a triangle or a rectangle or a text or an image. It doesn't really matter. In this case, it's actually a rectangle. And in the rectangle, I wrote view prototype. Um, and I encourage you to just leave that as it is, just change the, change the text. Uh, but just to show you that you could just double click on it and then edit it like you would do in Microsoft PowerPoint or um, in other, in other um, apps, Google Slides, for example. But if you click on that, then it opens up this context window that's uh, the properties of it. And so here you can do stuff like, you know, change the color, et cetera. I, I don't encourage you to do that for this particular element, but just to show you that you can change, you know, the uh, the corner, how rounded should the corners be, how big should the text uh, be, etc. So that's the properties of it. What does it look like? Can it do some things? If you, and here's a neat little trick. If you check out this draggable option, basically one click, and now the user is able to drag this around. So if you are designing some interface where you need to drag stuff around, that's all you need to do. Then you, you can do some extra stuff, but if I just leave that there, uh, we can drag this around now. Uh, so that's the properties. You can do a lot of stuff in here. And then the other pane in this window is interactions. And so um, right now it has an interaction and you can see that uh, it has a headline, the interaction that says go to screen and then the name of the screen it goes to. 
and then it has some details. So on tap, go to screen, your app example page. So that's the, the screen over here, your app example page. Um, this one here. And so I could, uh, if, I de if I delete this now and click save and preview, um, then that button shouldn't work. I, I can drag it around probably, yeah. Um, but if I click on it, nothing happens. I just stay on the screen, but I move that link to the other screen. So let's try, if I try and add that again, you can either click uh, add interactions and then uh, go through that menu, or if you basically, if it's a simple interaction, like going to another screen, then you can use this quick interactions, the little lightning icon out here. And there you have the chance to go to screen or change state, play audio. Right now, let's just take go to screen and then um, uh, your app example page. And the, yeah, so click on the element, go to interactions, uh, delete whatever is there, and then click on the lightning and say go to screen, your app example page. If you do that, then you can click save up here. And then it says saved when you're done, and then preview. Then, um, yeah, when you click on it, you'll see that it goes to that screen. Uh, and there's no way to, I think you can actually click back in your browser here, and they will go back. Then you can test it again and again. And there's some fancy interaction on it. I think it just applies that by default, because we used the quick interactions. Uh, but you might not want that. Um, so if you go to interactions here, then you can, uh, if you click on this interaction, then it opens up all the settings you have for this interaction. So you, there is one here called transition, and that's set to slide left. So if you set that to no transition, you click save interaction, and then click save project and preview, then it should just go to the next screen without the distracting um, interaction. Yeah, so when you click on the button, it just goes to the screen. You can still drag this around, so you can have multiple kinds of interactions on one element. <laughs> it's not very useful to have a button that you can throw around the screen, but if you for some reason need that, then that's pretty pretty easy to do. Um, yeah, so, but basically on this screen, just change the text, and then uh, all your complex interactions will be happening here. So that's that's a general principle that you have in the system. That if you click on any icon, any element in this in the system, or if you add an element, I'm going to add a rectangle here, just dragging it from out here. Um, then, um, if you go to interactions, you can click add interactions, and you can you can actually name your interaction if you want. Uh, and then you can choose what should it do. And so the ones we just use is called go to screen. And then you choose the screen uh, from the drop down, and then you can set the transition and so on if you want. Uh, but that's that's like the most basic form of interaction in the system. That's quite easy. That's like having a PowerPoint or a PDF uh, presentation, but then you put a little link and you can click on text to go to other pages. Uh, it's pretty much like that, except it's not uh, a text document; it's a, an interface. Uh, you can do a lot of more advanced stuff, but you can get a lot done just with that functionality, actually. Uh, so that's the basic, um, the basic um, form of interaction you can do. Uh, the next level would be working with, uh, well, there are two more things I want to show you. I hope we can make it, uh, is, is something called states and something called containers. And so states is basically, Instead of having uh, 10 different screens or I almost identical versions of a layout, uh, you might have a screen that um, uh, where you need to change the state of it. So let's say, for example, um, let's say you have, it's ex I think I'm actually going to show you the containers first. So. The way that works is what we saw with the smoothie app, that you can create this layout and then make it a container. And then you can do, make that work as a separate little page within the page. So I'm just going to do that here. Um, so we have this 
now that we're on this your app example page if you all go to that one then um, I put in some little comments to help you guys out with how to use this in the most efficient way um, but if you click on the list here that says label one label two then um, Let's see what I said here. Uh, yeah, so uh, the best thing you can do is just click on the whole element, and then it selects the list, and if you then click on the label two, then it shows some more options for that. And that allows you to duplicate it. And you can also just click plus over here, and it will add an extra line to this list, uh, but then it, will, it won't copy all the text styling, et cetera. But if you duplicate it, then it, it copies all the formatting. So if you click duplicate a bunch of times here, let's say, yeah, and as you can see, it just says label two on, on all of them, but that's not important right now. Uh, but if you just duplicate until you have a bunch of those. Now we have uh, a list. Um, and uh, so right now it's actually not, and I think I'm just gonna go ahead and make it actually bigger than screen, then it makes more sense what I'm gonna show you. So I just click on this little duplicate icon until it reaches the edge of the screen and just a little more. All right. Um, so now we have a list that's too big for the screen. So you could then, um, we need to have a scroll bar, but it's not a scroll bar for the whole page. It's a scroll bar for, for this section of the page. Um, and so if you just take this icon, and this element, and you right click on it with your mouse, if you're on a laptop, I know that on a Mac you have to click. You can sometimes tap with two fingers, hold down control and click. But if you have a, a mouse that you can move around and right clicking, uh, then you can say convert to container down here in this context menu. Uh, so if you click on that, uh, nothing seems to happen. But what's happened is you turn this into a, an element that's its own little element. Um, and if you double click on that, then it takes you to the container of it. And you can see it's created an element called complex list one container. It's a, it seems a little complex at first, but once you get into the logic of it, it makes a lot of sense. So if, you, if you're familiar with Photoshop, you, you might know about smart objects where you package little things into its own little file within the file. Um, or if you made websites, you know about iframes where you can put you know, one website into another website. Um, so this is kind of like that. Uh, or if you work on your computer with folders, you can put a folder inside another folder. I'm just coming up with examples. But the point is you have this little piece of something that you, you can put into another screen. Um, so if on this, in this list, for example, now, I, I just add some elements. Uh, a star and a rectangle or whatever. Um, then if I go back, either clicking out here on your app example page or clicking on the breadcrumb up here to get back, then you'll see that now it's added those things to this page. But it's actually not on the page, it's inside this, um, this uh, list element here. Let's see if I can move it around. Sometimes it's it acts a little strange. Yeah, now I can. Uh, so I can move this around and you'll see that it's moving the whole thing around. And if you look in the layers panel, you'll notice that it, it hasn't selected a list and a star and a rectangle. It's just selected this one thing called complex list one container. Um, and so everything in that container moves along with it. And sometimes it doesn't want to move. Then I have to switch to another program and come back. But yeah, um, and so you can see now that the container goes across the edge of the page. So, but let's try and save this and then preview. Um, I hope I'm not going too fast and that you guys are trying some of this out as you listen. Um, but otherwise you can always come back and watch this video again or open up Proto.io later and, and play around with it. Um, so if you open up this, then you have this you have the list and you can click on all the list items that you've created uh, by duplicating. And you can see that these rectangles and stuff is in front of it, which is useless, but it's uh, just to demonstrate that you can put things in a container. Um, but you can't scroll, you can't click and drag, you can't scroll with your mouse wheel. 
That's no way to scroll in this list. So if you go in here with the container and click on it again, then in the properties we have, like I showed you before with the smoothie project, we have the scroll property. And so you can set this to vertically and then resize the, like now all the content of the container is actually here. So you have to resize it to the size you want. Um, and now it looks like it's keeping the proportions. And why does it do that? Excellent question. Actually, I, oh, okay, you have to hold down uh, control so that you can resize on one uh, axis and not the other. And by default, it resizes both axes, it looks like. Or if you grab the bottom right corner, you can do it as you see fit. So you resize this to just fit the screen or a little smaller. Um, then, and then you click Save. So you set the scrolling to vertically and then resize it to fit the screen. Click Save, click Preview. Then it gives you a list that you can actually scroll in. So you can click and drag like a touch screen uh, or you can scroll up and down. And you'll notice that the scroll bar is actually too far are in on this view. Uh, and that's because it's it's not filling out the whole area here. So you can go in and then resize the container or when you make the container you can before you do that you can put in an element that fills out the size and then select the element you need in the container uh, like this and then convert to container and then delete that element. Uh, but yeah, the, the UX is okay. You know, it's, it looks a little funny with the scroll bar. So sometimes it helps to put in an element that has the size of the whole scroll area that you need. Um, so that's that's basically containers. Uh, so you create this little piece of um, interface, and then you can you can actually put it in multiple places. So if I want, I can go to containers and drag in this complex list multiple places. I can also hold down Alt and drag on a container to duplicate it, just like I can do in PowerPoint, et cetera. So now I have a bunch of these lists um, just put in everywhere. I'm going to save and preview that um, just so you can see how it works. So it's creating these, I, I guess if you're a programmer, you call them instances uh, of the list in multiple places. And so the only one I can actually scroll in is this one because um, these ones all are, are too tall, you know, all the content is visible, so you can't scroll. It's, they still work in the same way, you know, and you have the, all the elements there. And if you then change the, the, the container to change, you know, change an element, change a label or something, and you save and preview that, uh, you can save on, on Control or Command S and preview on Shift P, um, or just click up here, save, preview. Then, when, if you could change something in one, you'll notice that it changes in all of them. So this is a, a quite silly example, but I, you can see how this might be very useful if you have, if you want to maintain something that's used on 10 different screens, for example. Um, so that's, um, that's how containers work. Um, yeah, I think, um, Time is running out slowly, and I want to have room for questions. So I'm just going to quickly touch on uh, states, which is some, it's pretty advanced actually, uh, which means you can do advanced stuff with it, but it might also be uh, more than what's relevant for, for this meeting. But what you can do with state is, states is, for example, I'm just going to pull in a rectangle here. Uh, I'm going to make it look like a button by giving it round corners and blue color, um, then I'm going to write text in it and change the text color to white. So I have a button here that says inactive. Um, and let's say this was like a toggle button. So I wanted it to change from uh, inactive to active. So I'm actually going to make it red, just as an example. If I then convert this to a container, right click and choose convert to container, then I can, if I double click it, I get into the, the container, just like we did with the list. Uh, and then down here, we have something called container states. And the way that works is right now we have just one state. Uh, but if I click a new container state, 
and then I have these two states which are identical to begin with. But then if I change something on one state, like let's say I change the background color here, click done, it's not changed on the other one. So on state one it's red, on state two it's green. And let's say I also want to say change the text. So I change the text on the second one. So now we have uh, two different versions of this same button. Um, and so what I can do is I can add an interaction to this button. I can click on it, choose interactions, and then say on tap. And that works with a click on the computer as well. Tap is the default one. That just means it will work on a touch device as well. Um, and then I say on tap, I want to change container state. And then it asks me, what screen are we talking about? And that's the current container, what container? Well, there's only one choice, which is current container. It seems a little uh, like there's too many steps here sometimes. Um, but that's how it is. So you then say, what, what state do you want to change it to when you click on this inactive one? And I want to change it to active, which is state two. Uh, so I choose state, choose state two and save that interaction. And then it just asks me, do you want to add an animation to this? And I'm just, I'm not interested in that for this one. So I click, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, it basically just adds an animation. You can rename these states, by the way. If you double click down here, you can say, I'm just going to call it inactive and active. If you double click and write. Um, it's not going to change your interactions. Uh, if you go in here, not the state it's linking to is active, not state two. So on this one, if you click on this, in this state, which is the state it has out here, uh, the red one, then it will change its own state to active, so it will become green. And on the active, you know, let's just, let's just uh, take a look at that. So what I just did was the container, if you click on the red version of it, then it changes to its green version. So another state where it's green. So we have the screen here. If I click on it now, it should become green, which it does. But if I click again, nothing happens. And that's because we didn't do it the other way around. So uh, we have an interaction on the red version, but we don't have one on the green version. So I'm going to go in and say add interaction, tap, change, oh, not screen state, but container state. And then the container you can change to current container, but I want to change to the inactive state, the one that I call inactive down here. Save interaction. Do I want an animation? Let's just choose create for this one. And then you can see you get this little timeline. It looks, it looks very complex, but it's basically just showing you how long the animation will last. Um, so now we've added a, an, a link from inactive. If you click on that, it goes to this state. If you click on this one, it goes back to the other one. So it, that's all it does. It doesn't do anything technically other than it looks like you're changing some, you know, some setting or something. So if I click on it now, it should become green. Yes. If I click on it now, it should go back to the red version. But this one, we added a, an animation to that, so it's probably going to fade the background color. Yeah, like you can see. And so this works. Um, yeah, that's basically it. This is useful for a, a multitude of different uh, scenarios. And one thing to note is that with these animations, it can figure out a lot of stuff for you. So let's say I put in a circle over here on state one. And then on state two, there's no circle. But you can see it kind of grayed out over here. And you can right click on it and say add from inactive. Now it's added the same circle. But if I change the property of this, like we change the background color, you can change the position, for example, if I move it over here, uh, then you are actually able to well, it's actually added the animation by itself because it does that automatically. So if we save now and preview, I know it's going a little fast, but it's just to show you that it can be done. Um, if we click save and preview after adding a circle on one state, state inactive, and then adding it to the next one, uh, then when I click now, it should just move the circle and change the color. Yes, but if I click now, because there's an animation, it figures out all the steps in the animation by itself. So the circle actually moves back and forth. Uh, so if I had animation both ways, it would look like, you know, the circle was moving back and forth. Now it's just animating one way. Um, so this is, um, yeah, just a little example of what you can do. 
So the important thing to learn here is, of course, that how can you do different things? And then you can use these principles to build um, something that's actually useful as opposed to these lists with stars and red and green buttons. Um, and this, the, the principles of states is something you can use not only on containers, but on screens as well. So on this one, I've added states uh, just, just to make it easy to get the layout you want down here. There's a, on the your app example page, there are three states, search and filter template, navigational hierarchy template, and blank template. So you can basically just delete the one, the states you don't want by choosing delete when clicking the little arrow here. Um, or you can move the one you want to the left. So right now, search and filter is the state it's on when you open the screen. But uh, if you move blank table template to the left, for example, this is now the one it chooses to begin with. So if you click, if you move that to the left and then preview the project, then you should get just a blank screen uh, template yeah. Yeah, like this. Uh, so I just put these in so that you can start out with whatever you need and then uh, work with that and then delete the others or uh, whatever you need. In this project, there's also one of these little popovers that actually, if you click on this blank F icon here, it opens up a little popover. You can click somewhere else to close it. So some apps in Folio might need to run primarily in a, you know, in a window like this. Uh, we have a bunch of apps in the prototype that does this, like uh, the file manager, bookmarks manager, notification center. And you might have something that just shows the status of a server or uh, news from some specific source or something. And so you can use this uh, screen to, um, the screen here, your app pop overview to, to put stuff in here, uh, anything you want. And then do the interactions, uh, perhaps in a container that you put in here. That might be easy. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. What happens, of course, if you click on anything that's system-oriented or that's another app, it just tells you, your users viewing this that these controls are part of the universal folio navigation, and so it's not available in this one. Uh, and then it gives you a link to the general folio prototype where you can explore these these other um, elements and click around and view the other apps. And so, the yeah. Um, that's basically it. There is something here called general interactions. I'm explaining here what, what it's used for. It's a quite uh, advanced uh, technique, so I'm not going to go through that now. But uh, for any of this stuff, if you have any questions, just you can reach out to me. We're going to have a questions and answers session now for the last 10 minutes. Um, but um, I, I promised the guys at Proto.io that if if they give us these two months for free for anyone that wants to work with Folio stuff, that that uh, I would try to make sure that we don't burden their support team because they're not making any money on that, at least for the two months. Um, so so do reach out to, to me or someone from the, yeah, reach out to me, and then I can answer any questions you have about this. It's also very useful for me to learn what challenges people have in designing for the Folio platform. Um, I already got the first prototype. I did never got to show that actually, but it's uh, from the University of Sydney. Jim Nichols designed a prototype for something called payables. We can view different invoices and preview them and navigate around in it and change the the different change the states of things and so on. Um, I can't remember everything you can do in it, but it's actually pretty sophisticated, um, and he built it with this template that uh, that we've been going through. So, and uh, and I already got some good input into how we should adapt the framework itself from him using this uh, this designing this thing in in Proto IO because I can see things that we need that we haven't built yet. So we're we're working on designs of elements that that comes out of this project that he's made. So that's really cool. So yeah, don't hesitate to reach out uh, with questions, or if you do some kind of pro uh, prototype and you want feedback on it, just uh, yeah, just uh, let me know. And now I think we can do some questions and answers. 
Uh, great. Thanks, Philip. Uh, while people are putting their uh, questions into the uh, Q&A box, uh, how, how should people uh, reach out to you? Do you have a uh, preferred method? Uh, sure. So um, they can um, – I'm just going to put it up here on the screen if I can do that. So you can reach me at this address, philip at sending.com. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, or you can reach me on Slack, and I'm called Philip Jacobs on there. Oh, I guess that's the easiest one. You can also okay. call me, but uh, yeah. Or you can reach me on Skype, actually, and the, the username is the same. Um, whatever you prefer. Great. Um, as, you know, one of the things I was looking for, because I was thinking about taking uh, the prototype uh, into a, uh, a conference presentation scenario uh, sure. where uh, Wi-Fi isn't guaranteed, uh, was a, an ability to uh, uh, download the, the prototype for offline use. Uh, could you show yeah. that? So in here you can click uh, up here, there's a download button. You can share it online with people to, to test it in different ways, but if you want to have it on your computer, you just click Download, Export Project to HTML. You can get all the screens in PDF, but if you then have different states, uh, it doesn't show that. But let's click Export to HTML, and then it just needs to generate all the files. And then you get a zip file that you can then open on your computer. Yeah, so you get this folder with a bunch of files, and uh, you open the index.html file. I can do that. Yeah, and then it gives you this prototype. Ah, great. So we've got everything there then uh, for an offline use as well. Yeah, and also if yeah, if you want to just have a backup you know, for something, or yeah, if you want to do it an offline presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a, a question, uh, <clears throat> so is the main purpose of this uh, is for people to design prototypes, uh, send a link to your uh, team slash developers as uh, use cases? The main purpose is for Folio to be a useful platform for the end users. Uh, so we want to make we want to do everything we can to heighten the quality of the apps that get built. Uh, and one of the things that people can do to to achieve that is uh, really think these interfaces through and test them out with real users. So that's the main purpose of providing this template. Um, a, a secondary benefit to that is that we get input on how to do stuff, but but we can only use that input if you're actually testing it out on real users and getting feedback on what works, which is the which is the case with this payable thing, for example. Uh, Jim was working with his colleagues who were pushing to get this special kind of list where you have an overview and then if you click you get a, a smaller version of the list with a preview, which is a, and then something that we can think about building into the platform, that kind of interaction. Uh, but that's only relevant because we know that it's a real need that people have. Uh, so w we only get something out of it if the users get something out of it. So that's the main purpose, for the users to get a good experience with any kind of app in the system. Right. So the, the, on, the, on the developer side, the, uh, the developers are, are creating uh, a toolkit with uh, widgets that correspond to the prototype. Um, yeah. So that's where we need to, to test the interaction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but they're working with the design team that I'm a part of um, to you know determine which which elements and components are essential and most useful. And so a great way to figure out what what people need is to for people to start designing stuff and showing it to users. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, another question, uh, 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 Birkin is going to look at the, the proto.io docs, but he, he asks, is there a way to load up lists, say, with uh, external datas 
uh, like uh, URLs to uh, JSON files? I wish there were. Uh, there isn't. Um, there isn't a way to use real data. So you're going to have to, to copy paste stuff in, um, basically. Uh, yeah. That's so this really is a, a static design. They're, they're, it it is. Goes it's to meant the... for, for people who don't want to code. You could also, of course, do like an HTML mockup with some simple AJAX or something. Uh, but this is for people who, who, where it's too advanced probably to use real data sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. Uh, let's just uh, pause for a moment uh, to see if there are any final questions. I don't see any. Uh, oh, um, Pardo seems amazing. Front end, uh, can the generated HTML previews be easily used for developers to copy for templates for real apps? That would also be amazing. But unfortunately, the code that is generated here can't really be used for anything. Uh, but what is very useful for developers coding the real app um, is uh, this is much more easy to relate to than someone showing you uh, a piece of paper with a drawing or a, a PowerPoint presentation of different screens because it's easy to understand that if the prototype shows me that when I click here, it opens up a uh, preview, then it should do that in real life. So this allows you to get much closer to the real result, uh, and that means that the programmers have much less ambiguity in the specifications, because even if you write something down, it's easy to interpret it in your own in your own way. But if you see an interface that actually kind of works without real data, but it kind of works in the way you navigate it, it's very difficult to misunderstand what you mean. So you can't reuse the code, but you do save a lot of time on misunderstandings, probably. Mm -hmm. You might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, this concludes uh, today's forum on designing your own folio app. Uh, I hope uh, you, oh, uh, one final question. Uh, hi, Philip, how easy is it to link to an existing web app? To, I, what do you, so like integrate with an existing web app in folio or? Yeah, maybe to an embed uh, an existing web app uh, into the prototype interface. Um, so I believe for security reasons, maybe they have, I think they prevent people from putting in stuff like hypers. So you can't um, see anything to some of your, really put in a link here that then links to another thing, which will open up a new tab in the browser. That's that's easy to do. Uh, but putting stuff interfaces into here, I don't feel like do that. Okay, so maybe just demonstrating a link out to something, but uh, not embedding something. Yeah. Well, uh, I just use, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, please, uh, everyone, virtually uh, join me in thanking Philip for this walkthrough of uh, the uh, prototyping tool being used for Folio. Uh, and of course, he has on the screen. Uh, the ways to contact him, and we also encourage you to continue the discussion on uh, discuss.folio.org uh, at some of the URLs that uh, he posted into the chat window earlier. Uh, the recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. Our next Folio Forum will be on February 1st uh, with the topic of community developers. Uh, we don't, I don't think, I, when I checked last night, the uh, registration form wasn't up there yet, uh, but uh, it will be up there soon on that same uh, openlibraryenvironment.org website, uh, and you can register for that then. Uh, with that, uh, thank you to our speaker, Philip, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Have a great rest of the day.